In the last video, we discussed what random effects estimation actually is. And we said that essentially what random effects estimation is, is to first of all transform the system using this parameter lambda, and then just estimate pooled OLS on that transformed system. And we actually stated what the parameter lambda was. It was equal to one minus sigma mu squared divided through by sigma mu squared plus t times sigma rather than a alpha squared all to the power a half. And in this particular expression for lambda, sigma mu refers to the variance of the error term uit and sigma alpha squared refers to the variance of the unobserved heterogeneity part of the error. So the error which we defined here is eta it, which is the composite of both the unobserved heterogeneity and the idiosyncratic error. As we stated this model thus far, there is a particular problem with it. And that's that generally we don't know what sigma mu uh, and sigma alpha squared are. So we can't just necessarily just substitute in for lambda is because we don't know what lambda is. So in 99% of the cases where you're doing random effects estimation, the first step is to estimate sigma mu squared and sigma alpha squared and use those to estimate what lambda is. And the way in which we do this is either via fixed effects or via some sort of pooled OLS. So there's some sort of initial first stage and from that first stage, we get our estimate of lambda, which we call lambda hat. The second stage is then to use this estimate of lambda, lambda hat, to transform the system as above. So essentially here in the equation above, all we do is replace every lambda in the expression by lambda hat. And then all we do is we just use ordinary least squares or pooled ordinary least squares on the transformed system. And it is these two steps together which we call random effects estimation. Because generally we have to estimate the parameter lambda in the first step via either fixed effects or pooled OLS. And then in the second step, we then used pool, uh, we then used rather pooled OLS on the transformed system. When you type in the command to do random effects estimation in statistical software programs, it does this first step automatically and then does the second step just after that. So you just get one single output. But what it's actually doing is it's doing a first step where it estimates lambda and then it's estimating the model via pooled OLS on the transformed model. So you can see when we state random effects as it is here, why we can regard it as a sort of feasible generalized least squares estimator. It's feasible because essentially what we need to do is we first of all need to estimate the parameters to transform the system. Much like we estimated the covariance matrix of the errors when we were looking to transform our system to remove serial correlation uh, in previous examples which we spoke about. And really this is just one and the same thing as that. Again, we are transforming our system to remove serial correlation. So what are the assumptions which we require in order to derive some properties of this random effects estimator? The first assumption we require is that the covariance of this unobserved term alpha i with any value of the independent variables, which I'm calling here x, i, for any point in time t must be equal to zero. Because remember, if it wasn't equal to zero, then we're going to run into issues of endogeneity. And what we should be doing is we should be using either first differences or fixed effects to remove this unobserved heterogeneity term. Okay, so the first assumption is that the covariance between alpha i and xit is equal to zero. And in most cases, that's where we sort of fall down with the assumptions of the random effects estimator. The second assumption which we require is that we have a random sample, or random sample specifically in cross-section. So 
our cross-sectional data is randomly sampled. That may or may not be a good assumption um, when we're talking about US cities, because you might suppose that there is some relationship between cities which are closer to one another, perhaps due to geography, perhaps due to other reasons. But we're, we need this assumption, as it turns out, in order to assume that random effects estimators are consistent. The next assumption is that the expectation of the idiosyncratic error, UIT, given our values of our independent variables for that particular i at any time s, and also given our alpha i, the thing we don't observe, this expectation has to be equal to zero. So this is just the sort of equivalent statement that we've got to have strict exogenous um, errors or idiosyncratic errors in order for random effects to be consistent. And then finally, we need the assumption of no perfect collinearity. And that sort of really should sort of go without saying because of the fact that we know that if we have perfectly collinear regressors, that we're not going to be able to estimate a model via random effects, fixed effects, or just ordinary least squares. We can't even estimate that type of model. And I should mention that these last three assumptions here are exactly the same as they are for the sort of fixed effects or first difference estimators in order that they are consistent. The only assumption which is different is this first one. And if each of these four assumptions are satisfied, then beta hat random effects tends in probability to the true population parameter beta. So that means as our sample size tends to infinity, and we're considering t being fixed, then our random effects estimates actually are centered on the true population parameters beta. And as our sample size increases indefinitely, we actually converge to that particular parameter beta, which is in the population.